Hello, my name is Sam Gray, and I'm the curator at the Auburn Corps Duesenberg Automobile Museum, and I'm here with Diane Hall, the Collections Manager. Every month we present a curatorial spotlight, which is a presentation about a certain topic or theme. Due to the current circumstances with COVID-19, this presentation will be given virtually. The theme for April, May, and June in conjunction with the Auburn Corps Duesenberg Club's theme for the 2020 annual reunion focuses on women behind the wheel. This presentation, titled Women Workers of the Auburn Automobile Company, explores research into a largely unexplored and unspoken topic, the women who worked at the Auburn Automobile Company. This presentation will look at their roles within the company, their income and types of income, demographics, and lives within the community. While the story of the Auburn Automobile Company celebrates the likes of President E.O. Cord, designers Gordon Bjerg, Alan Leamy, and more, one facet that remains largely missing from the story is the women that worked at the company. How many women worked there? What were their roles? How did they contribute? All these questions and more will be explored in the upcoming slides. To begin, we need a good base to work from. So we are starting with DeKalb County in general, looking at total population, number of farms, and then current state of industries in the area within the time range of 1925 to 1937. This serves to show that DeKalb County was a very rural area and with that were rural customs and traditions. In 1931, within DeKalb County, only 291 people out of 24,911 were listed as unemployed. This seems like a very low number, but even in 1931, just like how it factors in today, people not seeking employment do not count towards the unemployment percentage. Also notice that the unemployment was very low given that the Great Depression had just started one and a half years prior. Looking at the same statistics for Auburn itself, we see that in 1930, the population was just over 5,000 people. Whereas the county had one farm per every nine people, as seen in the previous slide, Auburn had one factory per every 220 people. As with many small rural towns with agricultural counties, Auburn was close-knit and had its fair share of clubs and means to socialize. The best and more useful means for finding these statistics for the county and city were through phone books and directories. Old phone records for families and individuals would state their address, but also state their place of employment, while the factories would have their location listed. Auburn was also fairly uncommon for a small town of its size in terms of the amount and prominence of manufacturing and technological industries within the city and within this time frame of 1925 through 1937. Now we need just a brief overview of the Auburn Automobile Company itself. It was founded in 1900 with the first production automobile in 1903. It grew from a small local car maker to a successful regional marquee. The company had a downturn in the late 1910s and the early 1920s until E.L. Cord came aboard in 1924 as general manager and president in 1926. The company had 592 employees at its peak from Auburn itself, as long as city directories are to be believed. This accounts for approximately 12% of the population of Auburn. Despite being two years into the Great Depression, 1931 was the best ever year for the Auburn Automobile Company with 33,000 cars sold, making Auburn the 13th best-selling brand in 1931. This success is notable, as it will be seen shortly. Here we see a photo of the production line in Auburn. Here is the Cord L29 body drop in the factory. Here, the finishing touches are being done to a series of 1930s Auburns on the assembly line. Note that the Auburn is still being pushed down the line on a rail cart, which will soon be moved by its wheels after this stage. Here, President E.L. Cord on the left and Vice President Roy Faulkner stand behind a 1927 Auburn on the grounds of the Auburn Automobile Company.
When the Auburn Automobile Company looked to expand within the city, the council denied them the ability to purchase more land. Therefore, the largest employer within Auburn and DeKalb County ended up moving the great majority of its manufacturing out of the city into Connersville, Indiana, creating a large void in jobs, particularly those within roles filled traditionally by men, such as factory workers, tooling, and more. Auburn fully moved their manufacturing to Connersville by 1933. Look at the percentage of women workers within the company. It grew from just 8% in 1925 to over a quarter of the workforce after 1925. A large increase in percentage of women workers is due in part to the lessening of manufacturing in Auburn. Male workers were not able or unwilling to work in an office environment. There were business colleges in nearby Fort Wayne that contributed to the number of women able to work within office environments. We will explore this further in upcoming slides. Let's take a step back and look at some sources for the previous statistics. As mentioned before, city directories were the best primary source of information for the research into women workers. As is with the nature of historical documents, there are a lot of incomplete or missing factory and administrative notes from the company itself, due to many of the records being destroyed in 1937 when the company closed. City directories are a treasure trove of historical information in a primary source. They provide a list of factories, businesses, churches, and the prominent people pertaining to those and more. City directories became the primary source for information about the women workers as they typically listed the place of employment along with resident names and addresses. The pages shown here are a list of some of the churches and lodges within Auburn. On this page, which lists names and addresses, notice the means of employment are also listed. Why would we care about population changes from city and county as a whole? It shows a change from the farming and agricultural areas of the county to the city where it is more industrial, commercial, and technological. During the growth, lull, and expansion of the Auburn Automobile Company following 1924, note the number of people who moved to Auburn. The city gained about as many people as the county lost in the same period from 1920 to 1930, even when compared to neighboring cities like Garrett. It could be theorized that the growth of the Auburn Automobile Company contributed in some percentage to the number of people moving to Auburn from other DeKalb communities for employment. We also wanted to see how much Auburn grew and changed with the Auburn Automobile Company. The table seen here just pertains to Auburn residents. Using city directories, it was found how many women were listed as working at the company the peak came in 1931, which also corresponds with the company's largest sales year in 1931. However, there were large drops in women workers from the company from 1933 through 1936, which corresponds with much of the production and administrative tasks being moved to Connersville, Indiana. Despite the rise and fall of workers, the number of clubs stayed steady given the company decline and eventual bankruptcy. As a small, tight-knit community experiencing growth and a reduction in jobs, it did not seem to greatly affect the morals and values of the community. Here we see the known salary records for women workers by year and department. As mentioned previously, 1931 was the best year with the highest numbers. City directories stated 90 women workers in 1931 with company salary records recording 88. The company grew from just 12 salaried women in 1925 to 88 in just six years. It's also important to state that the salaried records do not include those who are paid hourly or by the piece. The drop off in numbers from 1931 and 1935 correspond to those seen in the previous slide with the number of employees as the company moved to Connersville. It was found that as the company grew, 
more women who lived in Auburn worked at the company versus those who lived outside of the city limits. Note in a previous slide that Auburn gained almost as many residents between 1920 and 1930 as DeKalb County lost as a whole, which shows that many women and families were moving from rural farming areas to Auburn as a small industrial town. Also note that while many people within the city directory stated their workplace and profession, some did not. So while non-salary women were counted here, it is not known what role or roles they occupied. Here we see some more simplified conclusions from the geographic location of women workers throughout the 1920s and 30s, including finding the same women in later directories with new addresses. We can see that in just six short years, the growth in salaried women grew 633%, roughly equating to more than doubling in growth per year. By 1931, just over two-thirds of women living in Auburn were salaried employees, and 53% of salaried women were living in Auburn and not within the outer reaches of DeKalb County. Here we see the average monthly wages for both men and women within the various departments that we saw salaried women working for a few slides ago. As stated below the table, men on average made twice as much as women for the same job and even more in some cases. The largest discrepancy is between the executive salaries between men and women. This is because women secretaries for the male executives were counted within the executive salary fields. Even though the wage difference was quite high, the Auburn Automobile Company was also quite generous with things like maternity leave, ensuring that you would still have employment after the leave, whereas such employment laws were not yet formalized. As we now begin to look more at the women's roles in greater detail, it is important to note that those who worked in salary positions were women who were educated in places like the International Business College in Fort Wayne. Those who were not more highly educated more often fulfilled the roles of manual labor, hourly, or by the piece wages. Additionally, it was more common for the women living in Auburn to have the salary positions rather than those from the surrounding county, which also filled the manual labor spots. If you are able to get a salary position, on average, you made between 22 to 46 percent more money than those within the manual labor positions. The first role to discuss here is the most common role filled by women, working in the trim shop and doing upholstery. These roles were not salaried positions, nor were they hourly. They were typically paid by the piece, meaning that their wage would vary per day and depended upon how much work and pieces they were able to make and complete daily. It is not known how much they were paid by each piece. This factory photo, published in the Auburn Automobile Company's newsletter, The Accelerator, shows a line of women seated at their sewing machines working on trim pieces. Low-hanging lights allowed for better vision on what was being sewn. You can also see spools of thread behind the sewing machines and excess material being worked on behind the women. Another function of trim shop and upholstery work included working on the skiver line. This tool allowed for cutting and sewing leather and other thicker upholstery materials into a specific desired thickness. Materials like leather and broadcloth were common in the automobiles. Note the stacks of materials stacked behind the workers. Workers along the trim shop, skiver, and upholstery lines were welcome to take home some of the leftover unusable scraps. Within our museum collection is this braided rug made from some of those leftover scraps. In the same vein, within the museum collection is this quilt made from used upholstery scraps. Note the different colors and textures of the scrap pieces. working within the administrative positions were salaried and included jobs such as secretaries, accounting and cost department, purchasing, timekeeping, and recorders. These positions required higher education and skills specific to their particular jobs. 
featured here as seen in a 1929 issue of the Accelerator are secretaries, stenographers, and typists. A stenographer is one who transcribes speech in shorthand, either writing it out by hand or typing them out. The speech would be recorded on a wax cylinder on an ediphone, dictation machine, or similar means. This would include letters, publicity, dealership information, and more. The Accounting and Cost Department, located within what is now the museum's Hall of Technology, was where revenues and expenses were managed. This helped the company maximize profit and cut costs wherever appropriate. They were also responsible for providing management with the budgets and recording any gross profits or losses. So what did some of the women working at the Auburn Automobile Company think about working there? At the museum, we have recorded interviews with a worker named Ruth Pebble. According to her, the company for a while was seen as an ideal place to work, the pinnacle of success. She also has some interesting views about the parents as the societal change, especially within a rural community, occurred within one generation. Also, it should be noted that Ruth Pebble was correct as there were no unions at the Auburn Automobile Company. Within some other interviews, Ruth Pebble and Claire Silch made some very interesting observations about what working at the company enabled them and other women workers to do outside of the company. It provided a freedom from home life, something which was not typically seen with rural and agricultural communities, which often meant having a tight-knit family with typical family roles. A sense of responsibility within the community, again, especially with community, responsibility would mainly lay within home life instead of community as a whole. Their parents were farmers and manual laborers, whereas within just one generational change, women were getting salaried and respected jobs. Other members of their families, such as husbands, brothers, and friends, lost their jobs due to the manufacturing shift to Connersville, Indiana. Therefore, women were beginning to become the breadwinners within their families, something very uncommon in small communities and within rural and agricultural communities. Auburn had an interurban line that connected with Fort Wayne and Waterloo and other smaller lines by the Auburn Junction, which created many connections via train travel. Let's reflect on some of the conclusions from this presentation. Women from Auburn tended to work in the salaried and office jobs, such as secretaries, while those from the county tended towards the manual positions by the piece jobs, such as trim shop and upholstery. The office positions paid far better than the manual positions. Auburn saw a migration of workers come from the county into the city to work at the company. Working at the company saw women workers an increase of social activity and the social scene within Increase of clubs and activities. Finally, especially as manufacturing moved out of the city and to Connorsville, Indiana, women's positions moved from supplementing income within their families to becoming the breadwinners in their families. Thank you for listening to this presentation. I hope this shed light on women workers at the Auburn Automobile Company, a topic that has not been largely explored. If you should have any questions or comments, please feel free to contact me at Sam G, that's S A M G, at automobilemuseum.org. There is far more research done than what was presented here in this presentation. The museum is set to reopen to the public on Sunday, June 14th. Therefore, we hope that date remains, and so the next presentation with a tour will be in person. Thank you again. Take care and stay safe.